Welcome to TechRamCast. In this episode of TechRamCast, we welcome Joe, who has recently worked on a project along with other members of TechRam called Dig the Line Bottle and Bar, which is a bar in Kyoto. And we'd like to talk a little bit about the project itself, but also kind of talk about the craft beer culture in Japan, especially, and then kind of the visual elements and the design elements of those cultures. So without further ado, welcome Joe, and this is Ken. <laughs> Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Ken. How's it going? All right. How are you? Good, good. All uh, right. So let me just float you here for your little image on this uh, slide deck. Uh, so uh, talking about Dig the Line, uh, right, a recent project um, that we did the branding for. Uh, it was for um, a company, Sakahachi, as we see here uh, in the uh, the URL, whatever. Uh, that's the the name of the main company. Uh, they came to us uh, already touting uh, a couple of beer bars in Japan, uh, in Tokyo and Kyoto. Uh, really nice craft beer bars. Uh, and... Um, the what was going to happen is that they want they were going to open a uh, a much bigger uh well a new a new beer bar and uh, the concept was based on the fact that the beer instead of they they were also starting a beer importing company uh hmm. to import the best according to them the best uh craft beer from europe the focus was hmm. to do this craft beer bar on on um, beer from france uh, Belgium, uh, uh, the Netherlands, and and the UK a little bit. So basically, looking at countries that are a little bit look looked over in the craft beer scene. You know, it's very uh, focused on the US usually. Uh, I, it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at you know old old style old world style beer or new world style mm -hmm. beer, but. They were going in this sort of new, interesting direction. And so they said, okay, we're creating this Dig the Line brand. It's going to be our importing company. And uh, we're also going to create this new uh, bar in Kyoto at this wonderful old building called the Shimpukan, uh, which is mm -hmm. the image we see here. And uh, this, this building was basically sold, rebought, uh, and purchased, sorry, by... Um, some developers and they were going to have some bars in there and the new Ace Hotel uh, of yep. Kyoto, which is pretty interesting. Anyhow, uh, so they're, they were going to do this bar there and they need to basically create branding for the new uh, craft beer shop, but also the whole mm -hmm. Dig the Line importing business and mm -hmm. revamp a bit of the general look of the Sakahachi brand, which mm -hmm. uh, historically speaking is interesting because uh, Ohigashi, uh, Ohigashi-san, which is the owner of Sakahachi, comes from a family mm -hmm. of sake brewers uh, back in the day. And although they don't make sake anymore, he's into craft beer and he wants to mm. revive his family's sake business or sake brewing business eventually. But his path to get there is by becoming a craft beer importer. So <laughs> I guess maybe uh, a quick way to summarize that. Um, is to talk about the concept of Dig the Line. So the name is funny, uh, Dig the Line. But it's basically about connecting this line and digging this, this sort of trench between the, you know, Japan and Europe and connecting it through, well, first of all, in this, in the current moment, uh, craft beer. But eventually, when he starts brewing sake again uh, through Sakahachi, probably sending sake out to Europe in the opposite direction. Mm. And by doing that, promoting, you know, Japan's craft scene in Europe and promoting Europe's craft scene in Japan. And so that's the whole idea of Dig the Line. Mm. And uh, based, based on that, uh, you know, they, they do, uh, well, there's the whole idea of, of, you know, creating bars here and eventually there. Uh, but also, you know, uh, not just sharing beverages, but maybe events and things like that, which they've already started doing, you know, bringing brewers from Europe to their bars here, especially the one in Tokyo that they have, which is called uh, Another Eight. Mm -hmm. uh, they already invite, you know, some very interesting craft brewers from Europe 
for events and stuff like that. But basically the main, so when they gave us this, this, uh, this, uh, this proposal, and we were trying to think about the different kinds of uh, visuals that this would conjure up. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we, you know, we did interviews with uh, the owner, Ohigash San, and his employees and partners. And, and uh, what we came to see, especially through what he had already been doing, mostly by himself for the visuals of, of this company, is he's very into minimal uh, design. Mm. It's very, it's almost like fashion brand uh, inspired, you know, uh, in mm. terms of minimalism in both uh, color palette, tone, uh, and uh, collateral and everything. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we did a lot of prototyping and uh, we decided that simpler is better in this case because not only does it, is this uh, branding for, uh, uh, an importing business, so like a logo for an importing business and stuff like that, but also for a physical shop locations. So that mm. involves signs and packaging and collateral, and also for beer cans, labels. Mm. And so we, we were looking at iconic, simple, and representative of the owners, which is minimalistic. And then we had this whole thing going on about um, the audience, which is international not just japanese uh, because the brand attracts a lot of international attention so here it was just for example this graphic is just uh something about connecting right uh, like we said connecting mm. uh the east and the west japan and europe uh here sake and beer uh eventually uh brewers in the community uh communication and creation uh, because it's also a very design focused brand almost like a lifestyle brand too uh kyoto to paris for example uh because the uh, the uh, main business is located in kyoto uh and then at the bottom dig the line bottle and bar which is the name of the new location in kyoto which looks like this actually so this mm. is the new location in the ship uh you went on the website right ken yeah i have i have mm -hmm. and uh yeah that just launched recently and uh, so this, this bottom store on the left uh, with the chairs, that's the, uh, the small uh, new bar that we created. Mm -hmm. uh, the architecture was handled by a uh, architecture firm called Puddle, uh, which does some cool stuff in Japan. And uh, so we took care of the general branding though. Uh, so this shop sign is part of the identity that we created. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, it is quite minimal, you know, concrete, steel, a uh, few, you know, there's definitely uh, playful elements on texture and stuff like that, but it's generally pretty un unadorned, uh, a little mm -hmm. bit raw, but on the uh, on the sort of uh, raw but high end, you know, mm -hmm. side of it. And um, so, yeah, thinking about a, a branding for something like this was was an interesting challenge, especially knowing what uh, the client's uh, the client's taste is. He wanted something unadorned like this, but we still needed to brand it. So, mm. uh, as you can tell, lines and simple geometry is sort of part of the identity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and an interesting element here is that Sakahachi, the name of the the main company, mm -hmm. uh, is like sake and hachi, hachi being eight. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's eight taps here on the bar. Right. And right. yeah, yeah, exactly. This is what his fourth bar, I think. And in all his bars, he has these eight taps, you know, as sort of, uh. yeah, the visual signature, let's say. Uh, and what's interesting about this one compared to all the previous bars is that this is the first one that's also a bottle shop. Mm. So, yeah, and it was a really fun opportunity to think about how to display this in a way that wasn't just uh, like if you look at the fridge here you know not not only displaying it as a regular regular product from like uh, a regular uh, uh, beer fridge like you would see uh, in the west maybe or anywhere else like um, I uh, I lived in San Diego and you know it's a crazy craft beer city <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you know but I mean you're in London so it's the same for you right yeah similar case 
Exactly. And when you look at beer fridges, they're just stocked, you know, they, they just pile stuff in there and, you know, it's probably categorized and all that, but it's, uh, think, thinking about the high end aesthetic that, uh, the client wanted in this case, uh, you know, we were thinking about how can we display things in a minimalist approach with, with high visual impact without making it look like, you mm -hmm. know, just a quarter store where we're just, just yeah. filling the shelves to the max. Right. So we've got some angled bottles here that are actually sake because they, they serve sake and beer, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the beer is very, you know, very, uh, is highlighted in a very prominent way. And then we've got the labels that we create on the right side. These are the labels for the dig the line brand that we created. Um, yeah. And as we can see, they've got canning machines, which is still very sort of new in Japan. People don't really do their own crowlers or canning operations. No, no, here. no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they, so they basically fill up the can and they can it for you right there. And, uh, as it, as it spins, these logos are made to be interesting as they spin, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's the whole idea of that. Yeah. Visual forward, you know, so that if someone's walking around with this after buying it at the store and it's in their little transparent bag or whatever, people can very easily, you know, recognize, uh, mm -hmm. although, you know, keep a bit of a mystery, you know, not have just big slapstick text printed on it, but mm -hmm. more of a visual identity. And, uh, yeah, here's this close-ups of, of I think the line logo. The angle, the angled lines, obviously, uh, for sp spinning effect. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then here, uh, this is where we get into like more like how we got to uh, those graphics and the, that final right. identity. Uh, so I guess we could talk about the market. Um, yeah. Do you, is there anything you want to talk about specifically? Uh, before I mean, this? this is like, this is like what you would see in every single supermarket in Japan. So yeah. Kirin, Sapporo, Suntory, Asahi, those are the four top drink makers, like beer, not just beer, but like alcohol drinks maker. Mm -hmm. So there is this concept in Japan called the third beer and Haposhu. So mm -hmm. Haposhu is like beer, but with a little bit of other things mixed in it. And the third beer has a little bit more higher ratio of actual beer compared to the original haposhu. So, you know, mm. these are yeah, the, that's the, the, say, it's a, the ingredients restri restrictions, right? The restrictions yeah. on ingredients. So because beer has to like have just the small, beer. <laughs> yeah. Haposhu is like, yeah. they're allowed to put a lot of other things in it. So it's yeah. not categorized as beer. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think the trend Beer has always been the top selling alcohol, I think, of all different alcohol. But recently really? we've been seeing like a bit more rise in, I think starting like a decade ago, we've seen a little bit more rise in like cocktail culture coming up. So, you know, different mm. cocktails sold in a can around mm -hmm. Japan and especially female or people who's not you know, necessarily a fan of that bitter taste goes mm -hmm. for that kind of like, you know, canned cocktail style. So I think beer has been struggling a little bit. And then I think gradually the craft beer scene came in. So, you know, beer wasn't just about the lager with a bitter taste, but more of like playful with a bit more exploration happening. So I sure. think that's where we kind of saw. So if you go to the next slide, we started seeing things like, you know, like, right. So this is, this is actually an interesting trend. So like, you know, craft beers by the major breweries. So all Kirin, Sapporo, Santori, Asahi has their line mm -hmm. of crafty. I've just picked up. Yeah, the first we're trying to beer. infiltrate the craft beer scene just like in the yeah, West. So yeah, so it's, it's not exactly the lager beer. It's like IPA mm -hmm. or like white ale or pale ale. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how, you yeah. know, they've kind of, they keep, they keep some of the graphic elements from their original beer, but slightly mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And then you see on the next slide, like just an explosion of different beer trends, right? I think mm -hmm. you're, because I live in London and you live in Tokyo, you're probably more familiar and can explain mm -hmm. a bit more about these. But, you know, for example, Kuedo, Yona Yona, Nest Beer, we can even see some of them co like coming out to Western cultures. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that becoming like, you know, oh, this is the Japanese craft beer scene kind of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, Hitachino's Nest, uh, the Nest beer one there. Hitachino Nest uh, beer is is one of the one of the few let's say craft beers that I've seen almost everywhere, you know, in the U.S. and yeah. Canada, uh, Europe. Yeah, it's all over the place. Uh, but here, here in Tokyo, I guess uh, all of these are very prominent, especially uh, this Yona Yona and Suyobi no Neko, like this uh, by Yoho <laughs> Brewing. That and, and Koedo as well, you know, very popular. You can find them in any 7-Eleven corner store. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of like real craft beer, not made by uh, macro brewers or, or major brands, you know, pretending to be micro breweries. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the usual suspects, I guess, are like Shiga Kogen here on the left, bottom left. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if just that we just added a few other examples. There's there's tons. But uh, in terms of like visual reference, like we've got things that are more modern, like Hokkaido, uh, Hokkaido's uh, North Island Beer Company, which is this, mm -hmm. this blue green label here. Uh, you've got an old standard here with the drawing style, the pictorial sort of, uh, you know, each beer style has a different hand-drawn graphic, uh, mm -hmm. which is sort of an old trend, I think, uh, in, in my mind, but uh, they're keeping it strong. Uh, and this is Baird Beer, which mm -hmm. has been here for a while. Uh, Snow Monkey IPA is just uh, another version of a Shiga Hogan beer, like the first uh, mm -hmm. beers here on the bottom left, but it's for their festival that they do once a year, the Big Beer Festival during the winter, which is really great. Mm -hmm. But just to show how, like, uh, even though some labels can seem very traditional and boring. Sometimes they'll do some more like minimalistic graphic design inspired stuff, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the spectrum here, this last image the, is like old 1990s craft beer scene and graphics, you know, just someone doing a beer label in, in Microsoft Word almost. Yeah. Uh, it's so ugly that I, well, I don't want to say ugly, but it's so bad that it's almost, it's, you wonder if it was done on purpose, but I don't think so. Knowing the other labels that this brewery comes out with, it's sort of, I think they're all sort of like this. But it's just, it just shows you a bit, of a, a bit of a spectrum of craft beer labels in Japan. I think it's very interesting how, you know, there is a wide spectrum. And because a lot of the, obviously the craft beer culture itself didn't originate from Japan. So we kind of draw mm -hmm. upon references from overseas. That's why we've got like the next slide. But it's really interesting how the Japanese take has taken. So, mm. you know, kind of like, especially with the illustrations, with the overseas craft beer scenes, you see a lot more like rugged, rough imageries created. I think Beaver Town is like, you know, a representative mm. of those, but I yeah. think with the Japanese, there's a bit of Beaver. elegance or minimalistic drawings rather than, you know, the lousy, almost noisy <laughs> graphic elements that, we try and create, you know, I think it was originally intentionally created to attract attention, but right. then that, you know, eventually becoming the graphic identity of the brand, which is kind of interesting, you know, route, mm -hmm, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, I mean, if we talk about beer uh, branding, you know, visual, visual trends and the labels and stuff like that, you know, we, we did a lot of research on that too, you know, going from, you know, Belgian beer labels like this all the way to, you know, Sierra Nevada and Brooklyn Brewery in the U.S. here, like on the left. Mm. Uh, and then how it evolved into, you know, the current American trend of, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of like uh, subsets, subset trends in there, like, you know, focusing on typography and handwritten text and you know grunge looks and and lots of colorful graphics and then and then you know the opposite which became like minimalist stuff mm. uh, like modern times uh you know uh, there's so there's so many examples in, in the american crowd beer scene but then today it seems like things have turned into this uh it's minimalist almost in the sense that there's no typography almost no no, it's not like big text in your face anymore, but it's big graphics wrapping the can completely in you know, mm. visuals, mm. which I guess could be called maxi minimalism or something. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and so we, we looked at all that, you know, and, and McKellar is one of the big influences uh, of, of the modern trends and uh, definitely looked at that for our own branding. But um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I can't say it's it's a, in a reaction to that that we we came up with our our current branding, let's say. Mm-hmm. But I think I mean the the main reason is 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 to represent the client's personality and and the looks of the current bars that they already had and and you know something that works for them. But at the same time, one point you know something we talked about before we started the recording is. The point that this brand is not just something that's going to be on models, but it's something that's that that's going to be on in a space, and it's something mm. that's going to be dressing buildings and architecture. And uh, like in this case, it's going not it's not their own. It's not only it's not a building that belongs only to them, but it there's other shops, and you know it has to play nice with uh, with the environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so be so. Simple, yet memorable, I guess is what we were looking into. And, uh, you know, hopefully we, we reached that target. Uh, the client's, client is happy from what I can tell. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, yeah, looking into the trends of, of uh, craft beer language and visual identities, uh, there's been a lot of movement. Uh, in this in just the last decade. So um, yeah, we looked into all of that. And in terms of contrasting with the current scene in Japan, there's a big difference, you know, it's, it's all over the place. So it's really, we could do whatever we want, but considering the, our audience is not only people, that, you know, Japanese people in Japan, but uh, you know, half of the audience, uh, the people that go to these bars uh, of, Sakahachi, half of them are, you know, tourists. And with the goal of eventually uh, creating new bars in Europe and outside Japan, mm-hmm. then, you know, it's got to be something that uh, respond, can, can, that uh, audience can respond to in any language and in any context. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's how we ended up uh, where we ended up. Um, I think it's interesting how, you know, most of the breweries, the, the intention of design or the kind of like design goal starts from how do we sell the can? Whereas mm. with the Sakachi's case, the focus is always on the place, you know, it, with every other place, like other, another A, um, oh, take yeah. the line, it's always, you know, you have the place and then you have the individual identity for each of the places. And with right. the dig the line, it wasn't just a standalone bar, but it was kind of like, you know, We've had surrounding atmosphere, which was like, we've got Ace Hotel, first time they're out of, you know, European, European American context in mm. Asia. So yeah. we're hoping that a lot of, you know, actual overseas foreigners coming into uh, Japan experience something interesting, but at the same time, something Japanese as well. So like, it's, it's very right. interesting how it's like, you know, it's an intermediate point of, Japan and Europe in a way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think it's kind of success this almost ruthlessly minimal representation feels somewhat Japanese at the same time the kind of design style is still very modern in some western manners I guess yeah that's what's interesting about um I mean if you don't mind I'll just pull the uh, Sakaichi website up but that's what's interesting about the design sense of, uh, of, of Sakahachi and their different mm-hmm. bars in a way. It's, it's very, it's all minimalistic, modern Japanese, which sort of has parallels with like modern Danish and, uh, you know, mid-century modern or whatever. But it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's raw elements, but yet, uh, you know, used in a simple way. So, yeah, like you said. Um, basically exactly what you said. It's, that's what was interesting. That was definitely one of the main interesting things about working with, uh, Sakahachi on this, on this branding project. Um, knowing that the brand has that sort of DNA to it. And, uh, Mm. yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely, uh, interesting, especially to have to marry that to the world of craft beer, which is one of my big passions. Mm. So uh yeah it was fun to say the least yep so yeah we got 
we had that going on and um and then we kind of like also wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to come start as a craft year but then start getting into becoming a mainstream and what that means in terms of like design right. as well hmm. obviously i mean you're probably more familiar on this topic but this is an example of ichigo beer where the left one was their traditional label for i think quite a few years mm. and then just this spring they've rebranded themselves into the the label on the right right, right. so it's obviously there's some elements of you know simplicity flat design the kind of like typical things that the designer people would mention about but there's a little bit more going on there you know you wouldn't randomly add an orchestra illustration in the background but they thought mm -hmm. the idea of music and the elements of orchestration is kind of important to their branding. So they've added mm. a bit of that. Mm. So I can really see that, you know, it's not just about simplicity to attract more, you know, graphic pleasure, mm. but actually still trying to keep their DNA somehow mm -hmm. um, other than putting that, you know, goat label in the middle. Right. The, the which is in itself German inspired in, in a funny way. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, this whole, uh, this whole evolution that happens or you know, just this simple change that happens when a brewery goes from, uh, well, in this case, it, it was always a big company more or less, but let's say a, a craft brewery going mainstream. You know, what happens to the, to, to the brand identity and the visuals of that, of that mm -hmm. brand, you know? There's, there's something, things have to change, just like when Goose Island got purchased mm. uh, in the U.S. or, um, I mean, Brooklyn Brewery, Brewery got majority purchased by Kirin and you know, mm. Japanese partnership. And although their visuals didn't really change much, uh, you know, we, we definitely still had to think about that a little bit. Like, uh, if we're going to try to be an international beer or something that can compete visually on the international market, like, how do we... Mm -hmm. How do we look to that immediately uh, rather mm -hmm. than wait for things to get bigger in the future? But yeah, it's just an interesting part of the visual craft beer trends, you know, um, like this, this precedent, which we talked about a little bit, uh, <laughs> which is interesting. Brew, Brewdog, what happened to Brewdog's branding, for example, over the years, yeah. uh, starting on the left and then going, you know, we're like, they had this very uh typical you know each each beer uh, beer style has its own color you know visual mm -hmm. impact you know so you can see it from a from a beer fridge you know far away when you enter when you enter a, a shop and the beer fridge is at the back you can you can see mm -hmm. the, the the red one the green one the blue one uh but then you know going in the middle here going to a more typographically inspired version of that because uh, there was definitely a trend, a, a typography trend in, in beer labels, mm -hmm. and design in general. And now today with this, this thing where they sort of got rid of a lot of the person, the grunge personality, which was sort of a part of the brand, I guess, mm -hmm. at the beginning. And now it's just very flat and clean. Like, like you said, like the, the new, that sort of material design, flat design uh, inspired thing. And, uh, you know, there's something to learn about this in the sense of, uh, you know, I don't want to say mistakes to be avoided, but uh, definitely like, you know, how to be minimal while maintaining personality, you know, mm. uh, which is hard. It's just funny for me to say, consider we did something <laughs> extremely minimal. <laughs> uh, but in a way, you know, uh, extreme minimalism can also work uh, to your advantage if you know how to use it. I, I mean, I, I hope, but I mean, in, in the sense it reflected the owner and, and their sense of taste and what they already created in their other bars and, and mm. things like that, branding efforts. But uh, yeah, this, this whole, this whole the, the, this, the dynamic of a brand changing identities for, uh, for changing market, but also for like the changing of their own size, it's definitely mm -hmm. an, an interesting one. Uh, so that was... It's a, it's I think a in the beginning, hmm. it's very interesting how, you know, it was kind of about 
being trendy, being on top of like, you know, what, what is like the niche supposedly doing and then kind of trying to capture that with the second element as well. Mm. But now it's more about how do we kind of formalize ourselves. It's not just about, it's not just about trying to be having that, you know, unique element of dogs in there, but it was mm. also about kind of having that look that you looked okay along with beers that we saw like, you know, Kirin, Asahi, how sure. would we look in contrast to them compared yeah, yeah. like previously you were compared to those, like, you know, just diverse range of products. And then you had to have your own strength, but now mm. you kind of need to keep that, but still be able to compete with the major labels. Now we're talking about like, you know, brick and lager. How do we yeah. compare ourselves to that? And then you kind of start needing to have more bolder, more stronger messaging. And it's kind yeah. of interesting how we kind of need to like, recline to those in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult because especially for these brands, uh, this is different from like what happened with us with uh, Dig the Line and, and Sakahachi. Like these brands compete in the stores, on the shelves, mm. in the beer fridges, and you know they they, all, they each they all fight for shelf space and uh, visual pop. You know, I don't yeah. know how much uh, how much of uh, the customer base that goes into a, a beer store it uh, it, it might be, but a good part of it are, you know, newbies, people that don't research the market all the time, like crazy beer geeks like I am. Or they don't know exactly <laughs> what they want. And, you know, they, it's like wine, you know, it's, uh, they, they go for the label that screams their name, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so in that sense, it's difficult for these brands to try to, you know, have that attraction value, but also, you know, please the most, eyes not just the most palettes but in our case we were lucky we don't have that problem you know we only sell in the store where where you know they serve the beer and uh and it's more like a repackaging uh instance right where like the beers in these in the cans and the sakahachi cans here on the right are, are basically beers from other breweries that we just that, that they just pour into a can and, and package up it's not their own beer so uh even though you know I'm happy with the differentiation between the uh, the, the house cans and and the third party or the you know microbrewery cans in the fridge, you know there is a, a nice distinct visual difference. But uh, our problem is very different from you know a microbrewery starting from starting a visual identity from scratch, competing in a in a typical store environment. You know, so I think it's an interesting standpoint because you know take the line we designed the shop like we're, we weren't designing a beer brand but we were designing an alcohol liquor shop basically and then mm. beer was part of it the architecture was obviously like you know a part of it as well and then you had the sh shop front visuals everything and then mm. if you come from that standpoint it's not about trying to create the most visually attractive beer label but it's more about how do we create this consistent design throughout right. the shop experience Right. And it's kind of interesting because I kind of see the kind of same trend as D2C where, you know, we've, okay, we've got to design everything and then everything has to be flawless in the design experience that provides. And if you come from there, the starting point is going to be quite minimalistic. But as we see with the, the cans we've designed, each design has to be done in a way that, you know, it kind of like demands for a certain place. It's not just mm. about, okay, we put on those stripes, that's done. but there is, you know, you think about, okay, these cans are going to sit where, you know, we're going to can them. So we need to kind of place them and they're going to rotate. So it's going to have a bit more playful element, that kind of stuff, the right. detailed adjustments that we make to those design, I think are quite interesting and very sure. important, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Especially, yeah, considering the, the, the whole situation where they're placed in context, uh, they're placed in, in contrast to, the beer cans in the fridge, which are mm -hmm. multicolored and everything, you know, that can be yep. any, they can have any sort of style to them. So how do we design something that doesn't, doesn't get taken over or doesn't compete with that, you know, and mm. uh, it also reflects the architecture, as you can see here, uh, you know, the whole minimal modern Japanese architecture uh, aesthetic that we were talking about, you know, our branding has to work with that. And uh, yeah. it's something that doesn't, uh, it's not just something that happens 
and this store specifically, but all the stores that, uh, like when we're looking at the Sakahachi website, all the stores uh, Ohigashi-san makes are like that, <laughs> pretty much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it works. It works with his the the identity that he he's created as well. I think I I I was the one who added the punk IPA um, reference at the mm -hmm. bottom, but yeah. I was kind of interested in their approach in general, and it's kind of like, I'm kind of interested to see, so basically with them, they always try and bring the actual shop to the world. Like if they come to Japan, they don't just start selling the beer, but they actually bring the brewery with them. So they've sure. got like a space in Roppongi that is yeah. dedicated to kind of create that, you know, setting of yeah, what Punk sure. IPA or Brew Dog is. Yeah, 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 yeah. However, they're, original design language is quite different compared to the new, you know, the minimalistic approach that they've created. So I've kind of, I'm kind of interested to see how that might transform or if they're just going to have a bit more like inconsistent looks with like the shop front and the actual beer. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's not like, just as I've said, it's about keeping consistency and kind of like keeping that design language strong. So sure. are they, going to refurbish all the terror design of everything or are they going to have like you know an interesting kind of yeah way of question. interpreting the current design language in a way that yeah so that's like the typical you know brew dog design mm -hmm. yeah it's a little bit industrial a little bit mm -hmm. it's not exactly a pop it's a little bit rough look um sure. Minimal in the representation, but like you know, quite industrial in the kind of materials used and stuff. Well, like like the fact that their their main IPA, their flagship IPA, is called Punk IPA. You know, the, the original mm -hmm. visual is also punk, I think, and they yeah. just cleaned it up a lot to try to be palatable to a wider audience. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, is the is the essence of the brand being lost or maintained? I mean, that's a valid question, I guess. Yeah. Obviously, simplification allows for a lot more easier design adaptation. So maybe it's now easier to design trucks and, you know, oh, other stuff. Yeah. Or definitely. like pallets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see how, you know, they kind of expand their design applications and how that influences the shops and everything. Hmm. Mickler has been just consistent, just bang on, you know, we, we're going to use sure. this illustration. We're going to have this consistent message across all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's part of the reason why they can't, they almost can't change it anymore. Like you have to <laughs> keep that because you've brought so much effort into establishing that. Well, yeah, but there's no reason to change it considering how successful they are. <laughs> uh, of course, of course. But yeah, that's, I mean, McKellar was definitely a big, uh, big reference, a big precedent that we used in, in our research. Yeah. Um, but the, the uh, illustrative uh, elements that are like a, a huge part of the visual identity are, you know, mm -hmm. we we considered that we offered it as an option to the client for Sakahachi, and you know, it just didn't work with our brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, their McKellar is actually, you know, to blame for so many new illustrative uh, brands coming up in in the craft beer world, and not just that. I'm mm -hmm. sure it, in the beverage world in general, yeah. Mm -hmm. so their their impact is probably you know well, impossible to measure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Well, Any last thoughts on craft beer scene in Japan or oh, what you man. want Japan to have? In terms I could of go on forever, scene? but we we should keep it shorter than longer <laughs> if we want. If we actually want people to listen to this. But uh, yeah, last words. I don't know. I mean, I'm super uh, happy and privileged to have worked on on you know not only not only a cool uh, design project, uh, he, you know, uh, Tokyo, but also beer related. And uh, yeah, I, I'm anxious to see what happens with uh, bottle and you know uh, dig the line, see if they do mm -hmm. create uh, new locations outside of Japan as as they uh, as they're sort of looking forward to and. Uh, see what might happen with that, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting space, uh, mm. visually and branding wise. Yeah. So much to expect for. Mm. I guess that'll be it for this episode. Sure. 
thank you for listening to this episode of Takram Cast. Um, we'll definitely pop in the URL to pick the lines official website on the show notes. So if you can check that out, if you ever come to Kyoto, that would be fantastic. If you liked what you just heard, follow us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you're listening to this episode, as well as our official Twitter account at Takram. That's T A K R A M. Also, if you have any opinions, feedbacks, requests on Takram Cost, please comment on social media with the hashtag, hashtag Takram Cost. We love hearing your feedback and hope to see you soon. Bye. Hope.